<laughs> no, but, but it is funny to see just the demographic out here with blankets and sweaters. Everyone here is like taking it off. Like, oh, it's nice, you know. So, um, but welcome to our home. Welcome to Good Soul Church. I'm Dave. I'm the pastor here, and um, it's so fun to see things just filled up and just so many familiar faces, some new faces, and I always love. That every single weekend, I say this every night, every single weekend at this church, we have new faces. And I just love that. And I think it's actually uh, how the church should be. We should be inviting friends and family visiting and, and uh, all of that. And, um, and I just pray that today blesses you, um, that you hear from the Word of God. And, uh, and it's just a, a wonderful joy to be in, in God's house. And uh, if you didn't know, we, uh, we worship, we pray, we hear from God's Word, and then we actually fellowship. And we do what we think the New Testament church did, and they broke bread together. They enter each other's homes, they uh, talk about life, they talk about the good things, the bad things, they pray with each other and celebrate it with each other, and so that's what we do here at Good Soul Church. We have the, the birds chirping, we have sometimes lawnmowers going by, but it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing, and as a pediatrician, as a father of five, I don't really get distracted by much, so you might be distracted, but I'm not, so don't worry. Um, but I do know that all of us walk into Sundays differently. Depending on the week you had, depending on the season of life that you're in, um, some of us are on like these highs of highs, and everything's going well. Sometimes you're in this like low spot where just you're wondering how it's all going to work out. You don't have an answer yet, and um, no matter where you find yourself today, I just want to let you know that God sees you and will meet you right there in your seat. And I don't maybe know every situation, but God does, and so. Um, I just pray that today you hear from God uh, about maybe some steps we can take to know Him more, get closer to Him, and um, He promises actually to be close to those who seek Him out. And uh, we actually see this in Psalm 145, 18. Oh, I went back. Sorry, here we go. 145, 18. And um, it says this, The Lord is near to all who call on Him, to all who call on Him in truth. See, God loves those who seek out truth. And he doesn't need anything from you but pursuit of Him. So everybody's like, i got to do all this stuff for God. No. He wants you to pursue Him in all that you do. And so it's interesting to me, though, as a pastor, but also as a doctor who um, mentors a lot of med students and residents, it's just a weird time because I feel like no one's doing that. No one's actually pursuing truth anymore. It's my truth. It's, there's no truth or whatever, but like, there's not no this... There's no deep thought anymore, no contemplation about life. It's, it's like we're just getting things done and just doing things. And it's been sad to me, uh, knowing where I came from, to, to now talk to people and everything's so superficial. There's nothing deeper. There's no deeper thought about what life means. And I think just people are just apathetic. Um, there's just this like general like, eh, yeah, eh. Like life's just not great. You know, I don't know what my future's holding. Like not everyone's ambitious to do much and and it's really sad to me coming from my background and then really pursuing truth like, like I, everyone knows I, I didn't come to Christ till like 21 but like I was always asking hard questions I was always asking deeper questions and, and it doesn't seem like we're there anymore um, and I just believe that uh, a lot of things have come into life that have distracted us from asking those questions so we had the advent of social media just instant gratification, you can get it in one day. Like, it's here sometimes in the hour, right? Amazon is just like, you don't have to wait for anything. You don't have to, like, contemplate how that bike's going to feel. You just get the bike, right? Like, the kind of thing. Uh, constant distractions, our phones, uh, instant, just anything you want, you can have at your fingertips. Maybe it's a 24-hour news cycle. It used to not be that way. Now, I don't know. I remember we'd watch the news at 6 p.m. and you turn it off. And it was, like, all the stories of the day in, like, 30 minutes. And then you didn't think about it again. Now it's like... Update, 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 up, all day, right? What's happening? And they're all the same story. I tell my sports center friends, I'm like, you know it's the same story for one hour, 24 hours. Like, the sports only happened yesterday. They can only talk about it so much, so they keep doing it over. We see it all day, every day. And what I think it's done for people with the 24-hour news cycle and constant news feed, it's just made us all jaded to everything going on. There's no dramatic anything. Someone... It's that someone gets murdered over here, you think about it for one second, and then you move on. And you're just like, that never happened before. So I think just in general, life's just kind of like, eh. Because bad's happening, it's not quite affecting us, but when it happens to us, like, no one cares because they see all the bad happening to everybody else. Like, there's, there's just an ap apathy that's happening in the culture right now. 
And what happens is people stop asking harder questions, deeper questions, stop searching for truth. And I think the world's at like a crossroads. I don't think anyone knows what's going to happen. But I think we've walked away from God, especially America, and walked away from truth, walked away from seeking out truth. And the problem with that is we don't know where it's going to go. Because without truth at the center, things that are holding us down as a country or as people, um, there's really no clear direction on where it's going to go. So in the middle of that mess of the world, this church has decided to set everything aside for 21 days and pray. And that's what we do at the beginning of every year, is we just enter into a season of prayer and fasting. Because a lot of what's out there, we can't affect. What we can affect is what we are doing as a church. And so um, I find myself in this season of prayer and fasting really just praying for people to encounter God, to, to be changed by God, uh, to pursue God in a new and fresh way. For some of my med students, to actually for our eyes to be open, and there's more to life than just publishing the next paper. And for uh, you know some of the, the kids I take care of to like just even no matter what their family looks like that they'll get to know God one day. Like that's what I'm praying for for everyone in this church to pursue God with everything you have. And that's my greatest desire is for people to seek truth, um, because in seeking truth that's where you find God. But if you don't ever ask those hard questions or deeper questions, you're never actually going to find them. And so you might might ask yourself like, well, how do you do that? How do you seek truth? How do you Ask the hard questions about God. Well, it's actually easier than ever. And this is really funny because, like, no one ever had Google. No one ever had their own personal Bible. Like, this wasn't a thing until the past, like, 50 years that you could actually have a Bible that you could read. You could have Google and ask all the hard questions to Google, which got to test the answers a little bit, but, like, it's right there. <laughs> you had to know, like, the encyclopedia or have one to ask general questions, but now instant gratification. But the problem is we have access to truth or information more than ever, but we're not seeking it out. And it's really sad to me because right now, people back in history would love to have what we have. But maybe they sought truth out more because they had more time to think about it. More time to not have an immediate answer and actually have to question the answers and, and test the answers. And so um, I believe the most important thing I can teach you today is that truth's not going to come from Google. It may not even come from just reading your Bible superficially. I have a friend at work who just gave his life to Christ. He knew the Bible. He didn't know God. The way that you're going to find the truth is actually to learn how to pray. Because prayer is our connection with God, our communication with God. And if He is all truth, the only way to get to know Him is to spend time with Him. And so whether you find yourself brand new to this whole church thing, or you were praying before you got out of the womb, which some people have, you know, like they were raised with that kind of mama, right? Um, I have one question for everybody, and you have to answer honestly yourself. You don't have to blurt it out because it might embarrass you, but how is your prayer life? We're two weeks into prayer, this prayer season. How's your prayer life? And I'm not saying what Instagram thinks your prayer life is like. You know how we all like, position our Bible, the sunrise, with the coffee, with the perfect little leaf, you know, and then the Bible's there open to the perfect verse that's already highlighted, you know, and... And everyone on Instagram thinks you have the greatest prayer life ever. When you know in your heart you have no prayer life. You spend an hour setting that up, that picture up, but you never actually pray. You don't know what that verse says, you just knew it sounded cool. You know, like, so what, not what the world thinks of your prayer life, what is your prayer life like? Do you feel connected and close to God in prayer? Right now, two weeks into the season? Do you feel like you're hearing from God clear answers about like questions that you've had? And is prayer a priority, or is it just a, a box we check? Like, some of the guys and I are reading the Bible in a year, and I found myself last year, every once in a while, just checking the box like I read it. And, you know, it was a quick read. That, that was not me spending time. But, like, are we checking the box in prayer? And I love this scripture um, out of the Psalms. It's written by uh, King David. And it's just beautiful, and it's very convicting for me. It says this in Psalm 27, 4. One thing I ask from the Lord... This only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek Him in His temple. Are you like David and want nothing more than just to be in God's presence? Because that's a desire of mine. I, just want, I want that desire to want to be in God's presence. Because when you read that line, you're like, well, David, that was, the, that was the adulterer, the murderer. Yeah, he loved God. He was a man after God's own heart. But he had some issues, right? David had some issues. Well, 
Yes, he did. But the thing that made David a man of God's heart was his desire to be with God at all times. So when David walked away, when David had failed, he knew, i got to run back to the feet of the Father. I have to get back in God's presence because David experienced God's presence and it changed him. And that's my prayer for you. Because I know a moment in God's presence changes everything. David experienced that. So even as a failed man, he knew, I need to get back there. Because God will change me back to where I need to be. God's, like being in God's presence is all I need. And that's our prayer for everyone here, is that you encounter God's presence. Because no matter what I say, no matter what you do on the checklist, if you get into God's presence, you're changed. And so, David, he failed over and over again. He ran back to God's presence, and because of that, his life ended well. And he, had, he left a legacy, he left wealth, and he left uh, a generational blessing versus a curse. And so one of my most prayed prayers over this two weeks, and actually over my life, is that each one of you will experience God's presence. But I can't do it for you. It has to be on you to pursue God. It changes how you live. It changes how you deal with life's struggles. It changes how you celebrate when God moves. It, it answers life's biggest questions. Just God's presence does all of that. It's a place you get filled up and equipped to go out into a dark world and be a light. God's presence. And a robust prayer life actually is the way that we can encounter God's presence every single day. And it's my greatest desire for each and every one of you. But if I'm honest, this was not me for a long, long time. Um, up until about 10 years ago, I really didn't even know what a prayer life was. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. Um, like I told you, I came to Christ at 21. Uh, I was uh, raised in a home that was far from God. I was pre-med, and um, I was not raised in the church. I knew no scripture. Like, you know how I was like... Baptist kids knew all the scripture of the Bible in a sing song way. Like, I knew none of that. I didn't know a single hymn. Um, and then I got radically saved in college. I gave my life to the Lord, and I was like, well, what do I do next? I don't know. Like, I have no idea. And so, um, someone from the campus ministry that I had given my life to Christ at noticed me at some of these events as this, like, real novice Christian guy, right? And connected me with someone in leadership who took me under their wing and taught me what you should be taught as a young Christian, all the things you should do, right? Like, you should read your Bible every day, you should, you should spend time with God, you know, like quiet, like away from everything, you should, you should come to all the services, you should encounter God in worship. He, he told me all that stuff, and I did it, and, um, and I learned a lot. I was going into med school, so I got real good at apologetics, the argument for the faith. I could tear down any atheist argument, like I was head knowledge to the max. But, I had no prayer life. I learned to journal. I learned to soak journal, you know, like scripture, observation, application, prayer. I wrote it all down. I have journals from like, you know, 20 years ago that were amazing. But my prayer life was absolutely not there. It was just not a thing. And so, um, so I did all the things. And we started attending a church that was super life-giving. We loved it. We got connected. We were running the, helping run the youth program and all of that. And everything shifted. So we, we were checking the boxes. We were comfortable. And then I decided, to Daniel's joy, that I was going to continue medical training after residency and do a fellowship. But the fellowship I wanted to do, emergency medicine and trauma, was not in Gainesville, Florida. So after 11 years, we picked up everything, including our two children, and we moved to Birmingham, Alabama, out of Florida. I mean, we're Florida kids. Like, we were born and raised in Florida. So moving to Birmingham, Alabama, knowing nobody, and uh, we arrived in Birmingham, and one of our friends from college, a roommate from college, Happened to be there for one month before we transitioned. Like, she was out, and we were coming in. She's like, you have to go to my church. And we had already decided the church we were going to. I read this book called Radical, and David Platt's church was there. I was like, this is amazing in Birmingham. Well, she said, no, no, you got to go to my church. It's called Church of the Highlands. And I said, I don't know anything about your church, but we'll honor her when she leaves. We'll go back to the church that we are going to go to, right? <laughs> so we walk in, and she uh, meets us at church. We go to church, and... Um, and we get plugged in immediately into a 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I kid you not, it changed everything. So I've been a Christian for nine years, and my prayer life was pretty much non-existent. And I walked into a season in that church of three weeks of just praying and seeking after God. Doing everything we're doing now. Meet at 6 a.m., pray for an hour, go to work. Meet at 6 a.m., like all of that for 21 days, and it changed absolutely everything. 
And so um, through this organized and intentional time of prayer, where they were teaching us how to pray, our prayer life changed. Everything changed. We got new vision for our life. God moved in mighty ways, answered questions that we had always had. And it changed us. And it showed us the power of prayer in our lives that we had been missing for nine years. As good Christians, we were missing something, and it was the power of prayer. And because of that experience, and it radically changed us, when we moved from Birmingham, no one was doing that. But we had done it for three years, 21 days of prayer. And so we're like, well, we're just going to keep doing this as a couple. So every January, we pray for 21 days, my wife and I. And uh, we got to be a part of a church in Jacksonville that didn't really honor that. So what we do, we strain Pastor Chris from birth, you know, Church of the Highlands for three years while we were in Jacksonville. And we moved here. And the pastor that we were first under here, this was not his heart. And so what did we do? We did 21 days of prayer, my wife and I, with our family now, like, in this room. And I have video of my wife. I walk out, I come back from work, and she's here, 6.30 a.m., just praying and worshiping God for 21 days. So what happens when we started the church? We said, we are going to do 21 days of prayer and fast. We're going to give God our first and our best. And so, last year, when we launched the church, we started in 21 days of prayer and fasting. And so, um, it was so fun to see people come out. Um, this guy, that's, that's Carter. He's a little taller than all of us. But, um, but it was incredible because what you saw was that it was not cultural. No one did this. We had done it for a long time. But we got to teach people how to pray. We got to show them like how powerful this is. And, and 21 days go by, and we kind of ended on the last day, and it was like right around 21 people. And we were kind of averaging like 13 to 14 people every day. And um, 21 people showed up on that last day. We launched the church out of that out of prayer, and God has just been incredible. This past year has been absolutely incredible, and we think it's because we gave God our first and our best. We saw prayers answered, vision clarified for what we were going to do as a church, and people's faith grow in powerful ways. And so after that incredible year, there's no way we're not going to do that ever again, right? So every year from now on, we're going to do it, and we're in the midst of that right now. We're on day 15 of 21 days of prayer. And um, it's just been an honor to lead you guys in that again. And uh, and what we're doing is we're just laying our whole year at the feet of the Father and saying, God, you are going to move in mighty ways, but we're going to give you the first. So every single day, we do everything we can to enter into God's presence and to lead you in that. And so the first week, um, I just I was like, okay, how am I going to preach on this? Because a lot of people don't know what we're doing, right? So like, you know, like, how am I going to teach on prayer? So I decided to just kind of break it into like four parts. Uh, this week is the third part. Um, but the first part we said was, let's just develop a lifestyle of prayer. And what does that mean, to pray every day? What does that mean to have prayer in your life every single day? And, um, and then I encourage everyone to show up at 6 a.m. the next day, which was really funny. And, um, and I'll be honest, um, I didn't know what to expect. You know, we ended with like 21 people the past the year before on the final day. So I'm like, okay, we'll probably be a dozen or more, and we'll see what God does with it. Two dozen people showed up at 6 a.m. on that Monday, blew my mind, like, knocked everything out of the water, like, that, that I had even planned, so I'm like, okay, well, this is a thing, like, people are really excited about this, and so the next week, I, I decided, let's teach people how to pray a little bit better, right, so we taught the model of prayer, we went over the Lord's Prayer, and how it was more of a guideline than a rule, right, like, it was, like, use this outline to pray, and this is, he was teaching his disciples how to pray, and it was just really incredible to see people take that. Grab the little book, those blue books in the back, those, those are prayer guides, and learn to pray these different models of prayer. And we learned the tabernacle prayer, the prayer of Jabez, the Lord's Prayer, a few different warfare prayers, like things to pray so that you can pray. And I saw people, for the first time, be able to pray the whole hour. Because I'm, you know, I'm pretty observant, so I noticed people who were like, I prayed my prayer, I don't know what to say anymore, so I'm going to, you know, my name's... You know, and maybe take a nap. But, but it was funny. For this week, it was cool to see people pray the whole hour because they're praying through these outlines. And, and you could see people getting really excited. So, um, so today we're on day 15. And I decided today, we taught some models of prayer. We taught some how-tos, why. And I thought today we should talk about the power of prayer. And, um, and you can learn all the ways to pray. But until you know the why behind the what, like why we're doing this, why we're praying, you won't make it into a lifestyle. 21 days will end, you'll be like, that was awesome, so thanks Pastor Dave for leading us in that. Like, but if, if you know the power of it, you'll keep doing it. And so for the rest of our time, I'm going to focus on this, how to have an intentional prayer life, but why? So why do we pray? Why pray? Well, it's short, prayer is powerful. 
And it brings with it an authority and a power to change our lives and change the lives around us. And so a lifestyle of prayer has the power to change everything. And every day, if you pray, you have a lifestyle of prayer, your life will feel different. The day will feel different. The year will feel different. The power of prayer, though, for me, achieves three different things. And so I gave you some bullets today. It's so fun. So prayer, prayer helps us turn our focus to God. Like I said before, this, is, this world is full of distraction. Netflix, Instagram, uh, social media in general, hobbies. I, some of my buddies who want me to go do hobbies with them, I'm like, you don't understand. I've decided I don't have time for these hobbies that we love, that I love. I, I, there's so much else going on, like, and I've made a priority like, that the hobbies are not my focus. Um, family events, sports, every Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, like sports. Um, as, a, as an athlete growing up, I see the, the pull towards sports, and I have to fight it with everything I have to make this the priority. Um, it wants to pull our attention away from God. We need to put all that aside, just for now, and seek God out to really feel the power of prayer. Because he says this in Jeremiah 29, 13, it says this, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. So God's word's clear. If we seek him, we'll find him. But he's also very clear, with all of your heart. So, what does that mean? Like, how do we do it with all of our heart? Well, it's a priority thing. We talked about, uh, a couple weeks ago, what the first means to God. God can only have one place, first. Anything other than that is nothing. Like, there's no second place with God, right? So, whatever's first on your list is the most important thing on your list. And so, all of your heart means you're praying first. And that's why that book is called Pray First, that, that prayer guide. Because it shows him our heart's desires to get close to him. That's our number one priority. I don't know how many times um, I've tried to pray, and then a couple minutes into my prayer, I'm like, beep, beep, on my phone. I'm like, oh, man, i got to answer that. And that's the schedule. Uh, I'm good. You know, like, and I'm just distracted, right? Like, well... If I'm fully engaged with prayer, my phone shouldn't even be here. Like, because it, it's kind of given it all out. You know, it's a, it's a secondary thing that could, that could fill my time. And so, so God needs your whole heart in prayer. And I found that 21 days of prayer and fasting, for me, what it has done is it has set aside this time for God, where I put everything else aside. I don't watch the news. Um, we do fast. Um, not a full fast for the 21 days, but we fast. I mean, I seriously fast. Because I want God to see my whole heart um, is devoted to Him for these 21 days. And because of that, God's voice is amplified. His word becomes alive. My prayers become like robust and deep and, and not just superficial. And, um, and one of the reasons is because when you set aside everything else for 21 days, you set your mind on the right things. And Colossians 3 2 says this set your mind on the things above, not on earthly things. And all those other things, as much as we love them, the hobbies and all the other things, they're earthly things. They all go away. God does not. And the things above do not. So through prayer, we do set our minds on God and the things above. And when we do that, God promises to meet us there. And we get to encounter his presence. And we get to be changed. But I love this line from Isaiah because it's not just that you're changed. And we've talked about this before. But Isaiah 26.3 says this. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you. All whose thoughts are fixed on you. So seek God with all your heart. And the promise here is that when you seek Him out, prayer helps us turn our focus to God, which leads to peace. God will give you peace as soon as your focus turns to Him. During this season of prayer, there's, there's power in setting everything else aside. Because what it does is it shows you how the world will keep spinning without you world will keep going without you. So it puts it in perspective. And when you have that perspective, all of a sudden you have peace about almost every situation you're going to encounter. It's like, well, that was going to happen with or without me. Maybe I can't solve it. Maybe God has me positioned to solve that. But I'm going to have peace in this situation because I know God knows this situation was going to happen. So that's the first thing. So it helps us turn our focus to God and gives us peace. Well, the next thing it does is it prayer draws us close to God. Have you, under, have you ever wondered, uh, as humans, like, why we think about heaven and eternity, life after death so often. Like, it's a thing that humans have done since the beginning of time. You know, we find, like, sitting around a fire, you know, like, uh, back in the day, agriculture's done, you have no light, you have no lamps, right? Like, you just set a fire and until it burns out, keep the animals away. But, you, but you're talking about God, you're talking about the heavens, you're talking about these things. Well, it's because God did that to you. 
Um, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says this, He has made everything beautiful in its time. This is Solomon saying this. He says, He has also set eternity in the human heart. He placed in you a desire for eternity, a, 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 that you knew eternity was a thing. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. And I've always, I've actually memorized this verse early on because I actually liked a band called 311. Terrible band. No, no, don't listen to it anymore. But, uh, but I remember this verse because of that. That's what's funny, right? The church. But, but I love this because that human heart has always known there's a God and always knows there's more life to, to life than just living. And anyone who isn't asking the deeper questions is ignoring this in them. And that's why when they say, yeah, I don't know, it's not worth thinking about, I'm like, you're, you're ignoring a part of you that's crying out for God. And um, even as a non-believer, I was drawn to God's creation. Um, and it always stirred something in my heart. <clears throat> I mean, I could argue that there was no God, like, and like the best 21-year-old argument of there no God. But when I was surfing, and I'm out there in the ocean, and I'm just like, you know, my brothers are catching away, everyone's catching away, and I just caught myself, just, I knew I hadn't moved for, like, an hour, just because I was in awe of the ocean, the power of the waves, the, the vast life in that sea, that, on the eastern coast, like, thousands of miles to land that direction, and you're like, wow, like, this is bigger than me. That's how a 21-year-old agnostic kid is thinking. Not knowing that that's this in my heart, seeing God's creation crying out to me like the Father, but I did I had no words to put that into perspective. Because all of creation is from God. And all of creation points back to God and it draws us closer to Him, whether we ever name that as God or not. And once we connect the dots and see the beauty of God in all things, then we can draw close to Him. Because James writes this, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you, James 4, 8. And the, the, the reason a lot of people don't draw near to God is because they actually don't put God's name on the things that they're worshiping. And uh, this is why a lot of people worship nature things. They're so close to just naming it God's creation and then worshiping the creator, not the creation. And that's what, that was me for a long time. So, um, you see, great, God's greatest desire is to draw his children close to him. But he can't do it. He can only put things in your path to trigger you to draw close to him because we are the ones who walked away from God. Because when he puts those things in our path, it, it gives us proximity to him, and we have to then draw closer to him and he'll draw close to us. It begins with a, you know, a conversation with God about, like, um, you know, I see all this, God, I don't understand all of it. But it's drawing me to you. Reveal yourself to me. And we draw close to God, and then he starts revealing truth to us, and he shows himself to us. And I love the idea of drawing close to God, and, and we see it in a couple of different figures of the Bible, but Moses is one of the best. And in Exodus 33, 11, it says this, The Lord would speak to Moses face to face, as one speaks to a friend. And until Jesus, this was unusual. God was as big, far off, powerful, you know, smiter of smites, you know, kind of thing, right? But then he met Moses, and Moses was this righteous man who sought God's face, and God revealed himself to him as a friend. You don't hear that much in church, especially old school church, that God is your friend. God wanted to be close to you, and Jesus, also named Emmanuel, came to be with us. So Moses understood that communication with God drew him closer to God, like a friend. But each of, each, each of us, through prayer, can draw close to God just like Moses drew close to God. Paul actually writes in Acts, he writes um, about how God placed every single person in this earth at a very specific time so that you would seek his face. And we see it in uh, Acts 17, 27, and 28. It says this, God did that. God put you right here on this earth in this, you know, 2022, 2023 year so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your poets have said, we are his offspring. Do you see that? When you seek him out, when you uh, desire God and draw near to him, what do we find? We live and move and have our being. You find your purpose. The only person who can tell you why you're here at this specific time, in 2023, in Wellington, Florida, 
is God. You're here for a reason. Like, he created you for this season and this time. But until you get close to him, you're not going to be able to figure out what that is. And so what I said was prayer draws us close to God, and we discover our purpose. When you get close to God, Moses figured out what he was made for. David figured out what he was made for. Each of us will figure out what we're made for. And it's different for every single person. And as your pastor, I can't tell you what that is. Only God can tell you what that is. And it's only in his presence that it can happen. And finally, the third thing that the power of prayer accomplishes is that it invites God into your problems. And we all have problems. I mean, we, this life is full of problems. If you don't think you have problems, that is your problem, right? Like, Because um, you're like one of those ostriches in the sand, you know? Like, I meet a lot of these, I hate to say it, ignorant residents who, who don't know anything from anything. It's just weird that doctors are being trained without knowing anything. But they just have never read a paper that wasn't assigned to them. And I was just, oh, what? Like, you have to go be a self-learner, like a self-teacher. Like, what are, you, what are you doing? Well, well, they just don't know anything because they're not seeking any truth out. But, but they have problems that they may not see. And so, I don't say this to discourage you that you're all going to have problems. We all have problems, right? It's actually to encourage you that God knew you were going to have problems and has already come up with the solutions for the problems. But he's the only one who knows the solutions for the problem. So um, God knew at the very beginning that this life was not going to work out perfectly because when we walked away from him in the garden, the world fell. And so the, God's perfect creation got broken. Now he's going to restore it at the end and he's going to make all things new. But in the midst of that time between then and then, it is not perfect and you will have problems. So, um, so what do we do when we have problems? And most of us, if we're honest, we try to fix our problems, Right? I'm going to fix my problem. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to get up earlier. I'm going to do this, do this. Well, how's that working out for you and all your problems? Now, maybe you're good. Maybe you've solved some problems. But for me, if I see a problem that's bigger than something I think I can do, instead of trying, like, I see myself digging a bigger hole. Like, I, I don't feel like I'm solving it a lot of times. And sometimes I just have to step back and be like, this problem's bigger than me. It's bigger than what I can see. There's something else to it. And I give the problem to God. The reason we dig that hole and we can't get out of the hole is because the problems are different than what you actually see. And I hope you learn a little something here that your problems are bigger than just a physical ailment, emotional strife. They're more than a bad boss or a contentious spouse. They're more than that. God sees your problems for what they actually are, and that's spiritual battles. There's some physical things that happen. But there's always a spiritual component to every single thing that we walk through. And before you roll your eyes and say, oh, Dave thinks my electric bill's from the devil, right? Like, I see what you're saying. Like, no, no, there's not a devil under every rock. But there's a spirit on everything that's not going well because we are a fallen world. And so we talked about it a couple weeks ago, but I want to remind you of something. Uh, that we are a three-part being. We are a mind, a body, and a spirit. We are actually different than the animal world because of this. Animals have bodies, and animals have emotion. My dog loves me, and he also is hungry, and he's emotional, and uh, he has a body. My dog does not have the spirit of God in him. And so anyone who says, oh, do animals go to heaven, there'll be animals in heaven, um, and God will make those animals perfect, and he'll make them emotionally like wonderful. But they don't have the Spirit of God. That's what sets us apart in creation, is that God breathed His Spirit into us and gave us the image of God. We are God's image barriers, bearers. And so, with that to be said, there's a lot happening in our lives that aren't happening in the animal lives. And um, our spirit is what makes us children of God and what separates us from all other creation. And I love Chardin's quote here, and you might not have ever seen it this way, and I hope you love it. It says this, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having, I would say, a temporary human experience. It changes everything. You're going to live forever, somewhere. And in this human experience, there's a lot of spiritual things happening. And if we're blind to it, we're going to be fighting blind. A world that your eyes have to be open to. So when you consider that we're spiritual beings... Beings. We have to consider that some of the battles we're fighting are actually spiritual battles. And so I love 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5 says this, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. 
The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. <coughs> so Paul here is saying that most of our battles, most of the things we're fighting, are, they actually have a spiritual component to them, and they're against these divine strongholds that have reign on this earth right now. And these spiritual powers are out to destroy you as a person. And you're like, well, that's heavy. Yeah, it is heavy. Because you bear the image of God. And when the devil fell from heaven, he could not touch God. They are not comparable. This is not a chess game between two equal components. The, uh, the devil was an angel created by God. He's lower than God. But the problem was, when we fell, and we walked out of the garden, we gave authority to the devil on this earth. So there's God, and God's in charge, and God has won the war. But in this earth, we're going to have battles until God restores all things. So, you are the image bearer of God. And the devil hates God. So who's he going to go after? The guy he can't touch or the one that he can? And that's why you feel sometimes attacked, overwhelmed. Yep. So, like, we as people are going to have these strongholds coming against us. And um, he's going to do anything he can to destroy you. And if he can't destroy you because you're going to heaven, because you're giving your life to Christ, he's going to make you miserable on your way to heaven. That's his job. And that's what he's doing. Well... We have nothing to fear, though, because we know God wins the war. It doesn't make the battles not happen, though. And so, what we're doing every single day is fighting to live a life of light and uh, health and joy and peace in the midst of these strongholds coming against us. Um, so we know God wins. We have battles to fight every day. So if you're in a sp spiritual battle, not necessarily just a physical one, there are some physical battles, how do we fight spiritually? How do we do that? Well, um, I'll just tell you, it's hard for you to do that. Because in the rank order of things, the devil actually ranks a little higher than you on power right now. But we can appeal to authority. And it's like a, a soldier, a private in the army, may not be as strong as that other battalion, but we know the general. And we can call on the general, and we can call on spiritual things to move in this physical world and help us in those spiritual battles. And the best way to do that is through prayer. The power of prayer. So how do you pray with power in prayer to make a difference in these spiritual strongholds? Well, I think there's uh, three spiritual weapons that we can use. And uh, so when you get into prayer, you're praying with God, we can pray through these three things and have actual authority over the devil. And the first thing that we can use is the authority in the name of Jesus. Because the Bible says, every knee will bow to this name. This name has more authority than any other name in history, and the devil must flee from this name. We pray the name of Jesus over this house all the time. If you ever hear me pray as on my own, the name of Jesus comes up probably every minute. Like, Jesus is over everything. Because the name of Jesus, the authority of the name of Jesus, the devil flees. He cannot be in, that, um, in, in the vicinity of that name. He outranks the devil. And so we don't. We can call on to the general in the name of Jesus. <coughs> Secondly... It's heartfelt worship. Worship, remember, uh, we think of our problems all the time. Like, oh man, my problems, oh my problems. Well, worship is telling your problems how big your God is. And turning your focus back to heaven. When we lift his name in worship, and we talked about the God's names last week. We talked about it throughout the week. How to pray through God's names. These names, like the banner of victory and peace. And, and these names of God. We pray those names while we're worshiping. And the devil can't stand it. Because he's learning that his prob the problems he's causing you mean nothing in the face of God. So when we lift his name in worship, it puts him in the proper place and puts the devil in his proper place. And finally, we need to pray the word of God. When Jesus, the Son of God, was tempted in the desert, instead of smacking the devil in the face, which he could have done, he had the ability to do that, he just said the words he had already said. He preached the word of God to the devil, and the devil flee every time. All three temptations that Jesus gave the answer to the devil from the Word of God, which you can still pray. So how many scripture do you know? How many scriptures are highlighted in your Bible that you can turn to when you're dealing with anger or depression or rejection? Like, can you go to a scripture and pray that over yourself and, and allow that word to um, change your life? Because God's Word is a two-edged sword, it says, and it penetrates every single heart, and it makes the devil flee. 
The devil knows all the scripture, by the way. The devil knows God's word. But the devil is fearful of God's word because he knows the ending of the book. And so let's pray God's word over our needs. So when we fill our prayers with you know, the name of Jesus and, and the heartfelt worship and the word of God, what we see is that we're giving our problems to God. Now, God still needs us to work physically. We, need, we still need to go to work solving some things relationally. But we're allowing the spiritual battles to be in God's court because he has so much more power and authority than us. God is actually the solution to your problem. The solution that you think is the, the extra paycheck, the bonus, the, you know, whatever, the vacation, is not the solution. The solution is actually God. And so when you invite God into your problems, he becomes the solution to your problems. And all the other problems become minimal because we're putting God in his proper place. So prayer turns our focus to God and we find peace. Prayer draws us close to God and we discover our purpose. And prayer invites God into your problems and we discover he is the solution. So prayer is powerful. And developing a prayer life, a robust prayer life, allows us to walk in peace and purpose. And then we see that God has all the solutions to all of our problems. And so for the past 14 days, what we've done as a church is put God first. And we've done this. We've said, God, we need peace. God, we need new purpose. God, we need new vision. And God, there's some problems out there we need you to solve. And we've pressed into God's presence. And uh, we put him first. And it's amazing how God has just taken action. When he moves when you do that. So my challenge to you is to pray. Pray for yourself. Pray for your family. Pray for your friends. Uh, and watch God do miracles in each one of those people. Pray for your job. Pray for your future. Pray for influence over people. And then see God go to work in your life. Just pray. Develop a prayer life, knowing you have power behind your prayers. And just take the next seven days and press into God like never before. You might be like, oh, 14 days. I, didn't, I, I just showed up today. I don't even know. Like, what are we doing? Seven days. Just give God the next seven days. We're going to be here at 6 a.m. every single day this week, 7 a.m. on Saturday. And then um, we're going to kind of have this celebration on 9 a.m. on next Sunday. We pray every day, every Sunday at 9 a.m. If you didn't know that, we had 31 people here this morning at 9 a.m. praying. It's pretty incredible. And, um, and so let's press in for this 21-day season. And next Sunday, I'm going to wrap up the whole thing with a, a talk that uh, you know, I already kind of know what I'm saying. It's called the legacy of prayer. Because as someone who was raised outside the church, there was no legacy of prayer in my life. But my kids will have a legacy of prayer that they can pass on to their kids and then so on and so forth. Um, I just am so excited to end it next week and then jump into kind of a new series after that. But we're not just ending the series, we're actually starting the year. And I wanted to make sure that language was clear. The goal of these 21 days was not to end something about prayer, it's to start this prayer journey that we're all going to take over this next year. Um, 21 day season is meant to start a habit, start something that you never want to leave your life, like what happened to Danielle and I 10 years ago. We walk out of that season going, wait, what happens on Monday? Do we like come back? Like, what do we do? Like, are the doors open? Is this like one of the sanctuary churches where we just walk into the Christ church? I don't know. What what are we doing? And they're like, you need to keep doing this at home. <laughs> like, they said, we're not opening the doors. But uh, keep doing this at home. And, and what it started for us was a habit of prayer, um, a, a lifestyle of prayer. And God has moved in such incredible ways. And so um, as we end these 21 days, I just pray that it becomes something for you that you never want to give up. We're going to do it every year. You can look forward to that. Um, but I do want to say this, and I said it last week, I said it the week before, this will be the best year of your life if it's the best year of your life spiritually. So how do you do that? Well, simply put, do everything we do as a church. And that's not a plug to just like build our church. We design this church very simply so that you can do everything this church does and there's not a bunch of you know, to-dos that you have to do, but do the simple things we do and your life will be different. This will be the best year of your life spiritually if you do everything we do. It's simple in its design, but it's powerful in the ability to change your life. So the first thing I would do, make church a priority. We meet. If you, can, you can actually make your whole calendar today. You go home. Because all you do is you flip open, and you go to Sunday. And you, if you want to come to prayer, so 9 a.m. church. Or 10, if you're not there yet, 10 a.m. church. 
and know that that's every Sunday except for two weeks in the summer, which I'll give you the date soon, that we take off so that my, healthy, my family and I can get, stay healthy, we can go away, no one else has to fill the slot, like no one has to be here when we're not here. We're just going to take that time off. But other than that, every Sunday at 10 a.m., we're going to meet right here. And uh, there's no question marks. Make church a priority. Put it on the calendar. Make it the first day of your week, which it is, biblically, Sunday is the first day of the week. Um, so that the rest of your week is blessed. Like, that's what we did for 21 days. So the rest of the year is blessed. Make the rest of your week blessed. Every single Sunday, come to church. I've had multiple people already tell me that because of this past year, and they were intermittent, they were in and out, that they've decided that this year, they're making every Sunday. And then they made it. The first Sunday, I'm like, all right, one for one, let's keep going, right? So, um, and I think it's going to be the best year of their life spiritually because they've put God first on their calendar, first day of the week. And so God loves community. What we're doing here is building a community. He sees that this is how you actually grow in discipleship and, and in your walk is be around other believers. So when you're having a low time, they have a high time, they bring you up. Their faith brings you up and vice versa. We can celebrate together. We can grieve together. We can do all that together. So make church a priority. Secondly, develop a lifestyle of prayer. This will look different for everybody. Everyone's got a different job, different age kids, different situations. You have to go on your calendar and figure out, when am I praying? When is my time to read my Bible? When am I going to worship? Is it on the way to work? We have one guy in our church who, who drives an hour and ten minutes down to Miami. Guess what? That's a great Bible, audio book, and great time of worship and prayer. Every single day that should happen. Develop a lifestyle of prayer. Just o open up every morning. Get out of bed. Don't get on the phone. Just say, thank you, God, for another day. Thank you, God, for being here today. I pray that you're, you're over this day, that this day is your day. That's prayer. Develop that every single morning. It's amazing how that will change your morning. But if you didn't know already, I just said it, 9 a.m. every Sunday, because we're not going to continue this necessarily, the 6 a.m. thing, but 9 a.m. every single Sunday, come here and pray. Pray over these rooms. Pray over these chairs. That's what we've been doing. Walk through the room. We pray over everything. 30 minutes, you get to hang out and have a coffee before service starts. And then finally, after much prayer, and actually God revealed this to me the first week of 21 days of prayer and fasting, I, I literally was back and forth. Um, I feel like God has called us to start something that's super dear to my heart, to Daniel's heart. It changed our entire life. And that is to start a ministry called Freedom uh, through our church. And so this spring, as a church, we're going to introduce this ministry to a lot of you who may not know it. But it's a Bible study that takes about 13 weeks to go through. And so what I tell you is the last thing I want you to do is commit to freedom. Commit to this small group. We're going to do groups starting in three weeks. And... Um, and I have books coming for everybody. You know, they're already paid for. Men are going to meet on Tuesday nights. Uh, women are going to meet on Wednesday nights. Um, th at the same time, each of those nights. Um, and I say with full confidence that this curriculum and this Bible study will change your life. It will change the direction of your life. It will heal your past. It will put you on a new uh, uh, future plan. Like, God's going to change everything. And uh, so I gave you three weeks to make plans. Three weeks. And I did it on two separate nights. We used to do it together, like split, you know, men and women in one house. Nope, two different nights because of childcare. You don't even get a babysitter. We're going to do it at 7 p.m. so that everyone's out of work, hopefully. I work some night shifts, but not on that night, not on Tuesday night. And um, we did this so that you could come, so that you could look ahead and make this a priority. We're going all in on this, freedom for the spring. I want every single adult in this church to go through it. So you might be asking, like, well, how else are you going to serve me? Pastor Dave, we're going to meet for coffee every Tuesday. No, I'm going to see you at 7 p.m. at the house uh, doing freedom. Because honestly, at some point you have to go all in with this and say, this is how we are going to minister in this semester to the church and to grow people. It's one of the best discipleship curriculums I could ever imagine. And um, it's going to help you heal from your past, give you hope for a future. And um, I just am so excited. People who have done freedom know it just changes everything. So I'm so excited for this year as a church. And um, I just hope that these first 14 days have blessed you. And if you haven't jumped on board yet, spend the next seven days growing closer to God, getting into his presence, and you're going to see incredible things change in your life. I hope you're so excited about what's next for this church, because after 2022, like, I'm like, okay, God, like, way beyond what I was thinking, what I was planning, but that's how he always works. And so I just want to make sure, though, at the end here, I make one more appeal to you um, as, uh, as we step into this year. I want you to ask yourself that one question. Is God first in my life? As we end today, is God first in my life? Because God will only take that one position. 
he will take no other position. So if you're like, man, I just don't feel like I, I'm close to God. I don't feel like we're God. It's like, is he first? Do you go to church every Sunday? Do you wake up in the morning grateful that you're alive? Do you own a Bible? Have you ever read the Bible? Do you listen? What do you listen to? Like what, what, is, what is the input? Is it God's voice and God's things, or is it the world? So put God first in all things. And I think it's just going to be incredible to see, if you do that, what this year looks like. So the first thing you can do is put next Sunday on your calendar. It's going to be an incredible celebration at the end of 21 days, and spend the next seven days pressing into God's presence. Put Him first. Reprioritize and make God number one. Because when God assumes that top position, everything else falls into place. Things will fall away that need to fall away, but things will find their proper position, and all of a sudden, you find room for the hobbies that you thought you wouldn't be able to have room for because God took the top position. You'll find new hobbies that are better than the old hobbies. You'll, you'll find that your marriage is now in line with how God needs your marriage to be, because instead of focusing directly on your spouse, you're focused on God, and now you're just a better person in that relationship. So as we continue to focus on putting God first, this this last week of 21 Days of Prayer, I pray that each of us chooses to put God first, give Him our first and our best, and I know that He's going to just bless the rest. So let's pray. Father God, we love You. We thank You for the priority of first. We thank You that You are a God who demands the first because there's a promise on the other end of that. That You're going to give us peace as we draw close to You, Lord God, and we focus on You. You're going to give us a newfound purpose, Lord God, the purpose that we were designed for. And you're going to be the answer to all of our problems, Lord God. So today, we just pray that every single person who can hear my voice puts you first in their life. That we make you number one, Lord God. And we just pray that 2023, because of that priority, becomes the best year of our life. Because the best year of our life, spiritually. We just pray that you answer prayers. You meet people in their needs, Lord God, but you just lift them to a higher place where their needs seem so minuscule, Lord God, once they see what you're going to do through their lives. So we just pray that you were honored today, Lord God, that your word penetrated every single heart, and that your Holy Spirit moved in powerful ways. We just pray for each and every person who hears my voice, Lord God, that they are blessed today. They walk with favor today, Lord God, knowing that you are in charge of the world, and that when your hand is in it, Lord God, all things work out for your good. We love you, Lord, and we praise your holy name today. In the mighty name of Jesus, say, Amen. Amen.